personification of the Great Mother, one of the personifications of the Great Mother in the Buddhist tradition. And we were given this beautiful picture of her here. And uh, we learned um, her mantra and how to evoke her and call her. And um, then we also spent some time this morning looking at the nature of the creative portal. And um, this is um, something that is easy to perceive in the process of birthing. Kind of hard to mistake that portal opening up and the unseen moving into the scene, right? And uh, we looked at the requirements of the portal in general and the way in which creative power moves through a creative portal. And then we also identified the creative portals within ourselves and uh, looked at the way uh, that energy moves through it or doesn't move through it, the condition of the portals, our relationship to these portals in our lives. And um, we spent some time here this afternoon looking further into what needs to be done, to what changes might need to be made in our lives or what new structures might need to be put in place in order to be able to um, bring forward our creativity and to cultivate the different creative portals in our lives in as clear and consistent and unobstructed way as possible. And of course, I think many people uh, had, were able to see how, how this material is relevant to them in their lives. And one of the interesting themes for me, I was reflecting at lunch, I was reflecting on one of the interesting themes that seemed to come forward um, in our inquiry was the fact that many of you actually had a good understanding about the nature of the creativity and the nature of your creative product. And you understood that you needed to protect it in some way. And uh, I, I think it's very interesting that so many of you had this understanding and had put in place structures that were designed to protect the creative product, but were actually turning out to block you from your creativity. Mm -hmm. And then the task is, of course, to be able to generate new structures, new containers, to be able to not only protect the creativity in a more effective way, but then to be able to express it uh, more fully and directly in your life. And another common, you know, of course, one of the common uh, themes that we saw as people were beginning to look at what it might mean to actually truly express this creative power that moves through them and which unites them in the dance with the Great Mother, with her great creative generativity, is a, a fear. You know, a, a, there are different types of fear, but what, what does it mean to enter into that kind of a dance? What kind of a, what, what do I have to, what do I have to face within myself that uh, might become an obstruction to my ability to dance that dance with the Great Mother? And of course, this is what we were working on further this afternoon. And so this whole class is in itself a process of initiation. And when we're looking at the nature of initiation, how initiation is tied with change, how it, how it, shall, it, it, it creates one form as another form is breaking down. Old forms have to die in order for new forms to be born. And the way that the initiation works is by challenging the status quo, by challenging what is, and then allowing for the <coughs> processes of transformation to release the power that is held in the old form so that it can be dedicated to the new form. And this is a very important part of creativity, and that is actually the dance that we're working with all the time. And one of the things that I did not say, and I just want to point out, since we've already been through all of these processes together, is that you know we have this concept of.
the destructive goddess, or um, you know, that's often personified by someone like Kali. Um, and then we have the personifications of the generative goddesses. And I just wanted to point out that it's important to see that the destruction that needs to happen in the old forms is imperative. It's actually part of the creative process so that the creative forms can take uh, the power that is in those outworn forms and dedicate it to something new. And that is actually what we are in the process of doing here in this class. We're changing the way that we have been. We are changing our relationship to our creativity and the portals that hold it. And we are bringing forward a new way of being and dedicating the power that is released as those old forms fall away to the new way of being and the new forms and the new relationship to creativity and thereby stepping into a larger participation with the Great Mother, becoming truly one of her, uh, the word that comes to me is handmaidens, um, but that's not meant in any kind of uh, pejorative or less than context. It's actually a, you know, a, a great honor to be able to dance that dance with the Great Mother and to dedicate ourselves to those creative processes that she mediates and demonstrates for us. So that's pretty much where we've been in a, in a general way, for those of you that are just joining us. And, um, you know, we, we talked at length about the creative portal. And Bob, I don't know if you've ever heard of that expression before, the creative portal. Sure. Well, then I don't know what you mean by it. Maybe not in that particular way. <coughs> um, but one of the things that I just wanted, with your permission, to kind of explore with you is who you are <laughs> as a being in terms of your own creative portals. The, and the creative portals being these, if you look at your life and you see all of the different things that you have created, all of the books that you've translated, all of the students that you've taught, Menla, Tibet house. You know, if you if you look, I don't know. I mean, you are such it's a, a kind creative, of misery. I know. But you're know, <laughs> such a creative being. You know, there and I think that if if you look, you know, I remember we were talking when you were in San Francisco and you were you were feeling a little discouraged and you you were saying you know the Tibetan people are not free yet, but you know if you look at everything that you have accomplished, all of the different forms, Menla itself as a creative portal, and all of the creativity that moves through here, Tibet House as a creative portal, and all of the creativity and all of the teaching that happens through Tibet House, and the way in which Tibet House is one of the many creative portals that the Tibetan diaspora had to create as they had this huge creative portal of Mahayana Buddhism that they had created a safe container for within the Tibetan culture, as they had that destroyed. And, and you can look at the way in which the Tibetan people <coughs> at, the, at the direction of His Holiness were so dedicated, they had so much intelligence that they needed to create new creative portals to hold the power of the Mahayana practices as practiced in Tibet. And they, one of the first things they did was to establish the monasteries and to establish these centers for learning in order to be able to hold this creative power that is the essence of Mahayana Buddhism. And if you look at Mahayana Buddhism itself, it is a tremendously powerful and creative portal that holds teachings that are dynamic and which are, they actually the difference between Mahayana Buddhism and Hinayana Buddhism from my point of view is that, and again, you'll have to correct me, Bob, if I'm you know, incorrect here, but uh, Hinayana, of course, is a wonderful holder of the Buddha's first set of realizations, but it didn't allow itself to move with, this, with the Gandhan re Renaissance. It didn't allow itself to be able to take advantage of this tremendous amount of creative power that came through Tsong 
Mahapa, and that came through a Sangha as they were working with Manjushri and Maitreya, respectively, um, channeling this powerful information that became a renaissance and became a deepening of the wisdom that was available to human beings on this planet. And so if you, if you just, I just wanted to spend a moment to just look, you know, have a look at all of these creative portals that are around us. The, the Mahayana Buddhism itself, the, the universities that hold and maintain creative portals for that powerful creative force. Uh, the way that Tibet House takes its place in, in maintaining containers for that force here in the United States, the way that Menla takes that one step further. And if you look behind Menla and Tibet House, of course, you find Bob and all of, his, all of his creativity, all of the translations that he's done to make so much of this knowledge available to us. And he has offered this transformation. If we talk about you know, the, you know, the process of translation is the process of transformation. And you can see the goddess working through Bob wherever he is appearing. And he appears everywhere all the time. <laughs> and I mean, I, you know, I, I, I guess I'm singing praises. <laughs> well, I think we have to say that, that uh, Nina is the creative portal of Mela and Tibet House. In a sense, we are a team, you know, and I kind of have a voice about it, and I have, I, 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 I react a lot, you know, and blah, blah, and, but she actually organizes and structures and it, it creates. Without her, none of this much would have happened. Yes, uh, yes, all, all and, honor uh, and kudos to you, Nina. She's overwhelmed by it even right now. <laughs> 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 I mean, <laughs> and, uh, but that's very kind of you to say all this. What, what, what is it occurring in my mind? Do you, do you want me to do something? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's very, very sweet of you and kind of you. And uh, it is a tiresome thing. I'm, you know, I'm known as a horrible workaholic. Actually, Nina calls me a Buddhaholic. <laughs> and uh, it is kind of the, my nature. And, uh, but in a way, the, the whole concept of creative and generative, I, I want to just say something about that. Because the nirvana itself, is called the uncreated. When Buddha attained uh, bliss, uh, you know, freedom from suffering, nirvana, under the Bodhi tree, uh, you know, like 2,700 years ago, when it was, he said, profound peace, something uh, luminous, clear light, total free of elaboration or proliferation, and then do much uncreated, like an elixir of immortality, is the reality I have discovered. And then he, his whole thing went on from there. And uh, because, you know, the, the idea of divinity that people have, and it, it does still harken back in different cultures, the idea of creation, you know, that somebody created the world. Whereas from Buddha's point of view, the world as inhabited by self-centered and ignorant beings, ignorant described as those who think they are the center of the universe, and others are you know, subordinate to them, which others don't agree to, <laughs> ever, and therefore it's a strife. You know, because each one of all the individuals thinks they are the thing. And therefore, <coughs> nobody agrees with anybody. When, unless it's kind of sort of superficial, when everything is, everyone is, when the plates are all full, then it's like, oh, after you, you know, after you. But when, when there's a famine, mm -hmm. as uh, one friend of mine used to say, it's every bodhisattva for himself. <laughs> <laughs> for a fire or something like that, except for the exceptional being. So, so the, so creativity, the creativity of the Buddha, the creativity that actually I think true secret of all creativity, including the, the Great Mother, comes from, we have to decouple it from the idea of creating the world. 
just any old way, I don't think. And in fact, what it is, is creating freedom and creating a better world and creating a freedom from suffering for others. And, and that creation comes from beings recognizing it's somehow the uncreated and the selfless and the, the unborn. You know, it's like it said in the first stage of that realization, they say it's something called the tolerance of birthlessness. For example, then the thing of portal is interesting to me, the Vimalakiti Sutra, I keep forgetting to bring that. In the Vimalakiti Sutra, there's a very famous thing, the ninth chapter in my translation, where Vimalakiti invites 32 bodhisattvas, who are all incredibly wise sages, to express what they call the Dharma door. And here the word Dharma means reality. You know, the uncreated reality that is the reality of freedom from suffering, which is what we all are in, actually. Actually, really. We think we're in some place, like we're in the barn at Menla, at the, in the class, and then we're going to go somewhere else and go to dinner, go home, and whatever. That's what we think. But actually, in all of that, we're in nirvana. Actually, we're in total freedom. And uh, so the Dharma door, so that, that's the reality. But then that reality becomes a door. Because, in a way, freedom itself is a negation. You know, we think, you know, people, even, even W was going to fight for freedom. But he wasn't thinking that freedom is simply it's a negation. You say salt-free, sugar-free, trouble-free, mm -hmm. and after 2008, oh, W-free. <laughs> <laughs> it's a negation. And so, there, in a way, that's why people are afraid of freedom. The, the one guy who lived in Woodstock, actually, the famous Eric Fromm, mm -hmm. who studied a lot about Nazis and things, as well as many other things. I bet he knew the guy, actually, in the old days. And uh, he wrote a wonderful mm -hmm. book called Fear of Freedom. And, uh, yeah, the escape, freedom from fear. What? Freedom from fear. Yes. No, no, fear of freedom. Escape. Yeah, that people, you know, you know, the authoritarian personalities who wants to be subordinate to something and be bossed around and feel secure under some boss is afraid of freedom. It's, it's a very, you know, the Frankfurt School, I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big thing. So, but, so the kind of creativity so, so, for example, talk about a thing of beauty. What is beauty? What, what, what is it that we like when we say something is beautiful? Well, isn't it something that lifts us out of our habitual way of being? In other words, we're drawn to it because it seems to be, it seems to lift us out of the intolerable situation of being ourselves with, against the world. And maybe when we're young, or when we're very satisfied for temporarily for something, or under some kind of relief, we think that's, oh wow, I'm not against the world, oh, I know the world's great. But actually then we get sick, and we grow old, and we die, and people don't do what we want, and they do what we don't want, and we, we have a lot of problems. And ultimately, the larger game of it is that as long as we're in that self and other situation, and we're unfree, and we're driven by an anxious, you know, insecure, frightened, and therefore greedy and aggressive, and confused and depressed self. Okay? However, and, and freedom from that, so beauty lifts us out of that temporarily. When people say, people use words like rapture, which actually, if you think of it, it's not such a nice word, <laughs> rapture, but, or being transported, or being elevated, lifted up. And so, so beauty is, in a way, realizing the uncreated goodness that is there when we're free of the situation of self-centeredness, is actually what beauty actually is. And what is ethics, therefore, goodness? Goodness is when, you know, we're, we, we do something helpful to another, we don't, we're not harmful to them, or they're not harmful to us. And precisely that means when they are relieved that at least that part of the universe is not coming after them. So they're relieved from this difficult self and other confrontational situation. 
And, uh, and luckily, both of those things coincide, which was Buddha's discovery, which is actually, let's not forget that Buddha, Buddha's great successors, actually, Buddha was a little earlier, but Buddha's great successors were simultaneous with Socrates, with the Deuter of Isaiah in Babylon, with uh, Confucius and Lao Tzu in China, with many Upanishadic sages in India, Zoroaster was around the same time as Buddha in Persia, and many other people whose names we never heard. Uh, and so there was a vibration in the planet of the discovery of the goodness of the world, actually. That's why all the lawgivers in all of the civilizational streams that are now most present on the planet, even though people haven't been following their laws, mostly, but still, there were about 2,500 years ago, or what is called the Axial Age. So, I don't want to get into too much into history, but I'm just saying that created the creativity, therefore, true creativity, has to come from the heart, and in a way, arises from the, the channel of that creativity, surrendering to, to the force of the goodness of the universe rather than something one makes up and fabricates out of some idea that this enhances me, or this will get me favor from others, or, or whatever. You know, this is something, you know, like these people like Warhol, this is something I can sell, like a Brillo box. So, so now, therefore the great mother in Buddhism, as we said, you know, yesterday, is the prajna paramita? Is every and prajna paramita is not a person outside somewhere. Prajna means nya means to know, like the English. Did you ever wonder why in English when you know something, you're actually knowing it? <laughs> <laughs> now, what does it mean if you did pronounce that kno? What would that be? The K N thing is something that happens in the glottis. You know, <laughs> It's like in the back of the upper part of the mouth. So it's kind of like, it's a little bit of a control thing, you know? It's a little bit like a sneeze, you know it. <laughs> so it's like, a, it's a, by itself, knowing in that way is not really that useful. It's just sort of labeling something to control it. But pra, it goes before the pranya, means super, super no. And super knowing is the knowing where you have become the thing that you're knowing. So you're not in a way controlling it, you're in a way giving yourself over to it. And by giving yourself over to it, it you become completely empathetic with it and you know and you completely know it in an almost bodily, in an enveloping, enfolding, actually female way. Mm -hmm. And then part of the top means to go beyond, transcend. And what that means is you transcend the subject-object, you know, negotiating way of knowing of the, of the poor self facing the much faster world and seeking to sort of dominate it or be protected in it or all these fruitless things that ultimately will not succeed. They can only temporarily succeed. So, so, so the creativity like Basho, the famous Japanese haiku poet, he said, it was Zen, Zen, but also haiku poet, he said, if you want to express the tree, you have to become the, the pine tree, I think, actually. You have to become the pine tree, meaning you have to give yourself to the pine tree, and then the voice of the pine tree and you, between you, comes up something that opens a doorway for another person to feel the gift of the pine tree. But if you just sit back and oh, I'll do something great about that pine tree, then forget about it. It's going to be boring. Okay? So she, but what she is, a mother, yes, she, what does she generate? She generates all the Buddhas. And then in your summary to the newer people here, you didn't get into that, and I don't blame you. Because you get, well, we all get lost in that. But I felt, you know, I feel that in, in this special woman's focus, meaning class, my contribution was to kind of try to indicate why, from the point of view of Buddhist psychology and biology, the, in the Buddhist sciences, the female human form is superior to the male human form. 
And I'm not saying that just to get brownie points. Oh, I don't mind. It's a result in the field. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy that it does. But I'm saying it's because of the factuality of it. Which, because if enlightenment is not defined as people unfortunately try to define, here I'm repeating myself to you who've been here, but enlightenment is not defined as some awareness of some blazing light or vast space of light somewhere else, like heaven or trans heavenly space, uh, as opposed to this place of light and dark that's filled with all problems, and therefore sort of an escape from everything. That is not the Mahayana definition of enlightenment, which is Buddha's real definition of enlightenment. Enlightenment is expanding your sense of identification which the human being has special ability to do, where the human, among animals, has a particular ability to identify with another through love. Mother and child, you know, mother and embryo, then mother and child outside for a while, <laughs> till teenage time, or uh, at, at the latest. Uh, lovers, you know, until honeymoons are over, uh, etc., you know, teams, Etc. Be, human beings can expand their sense of identification, and the preposterous claim of the Buddhist sciences <coughs> is that the ultimate evolutionary form of life is a form of life that embraces by identifying with all life, all living beings. They say that a Buddha perceives every living being, including every cockroach and even the mouse, who you so kindly gave your chocolate to, or whatever it was, and your acorn, you best brought that acorn from far away for that mouse. Although I think probably it was all dried out by then, mouse was very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, even that mouse, one perceives as a mother perceives one's only beloved child, or the mosquito that bit me and gave me malaria three or four months ago, or whatever it is. You know, when you think that, it's overwhelming, of course. To think what that might be, how, what kind of consciousness could that be? And it's even beyond an individual body, like each ordinary person, they live within the envelope of a single body. And, but a Buddha does not. A Buddha is in every body, it's everywhere. And uh, every building, body, planet, continent, whatever it may be, they feel it's all their body. And it goes it's way beyond the idea of having, although there are experiences powerful, what mystical people call mystical experiences, where one has an experience of everything totally disappearing, except there being kind of just a vast luminous space. And one feels one is that luminous space, and one feels that all other beings are that luminous space, but the strange thing about it is all of them and oneself have all disappeared. So then it's easy to feel one is all of them, because there's nobody around. So here we're all one, and none of us are here. And so many people mistakenly think that's enlightenment. And it is an important step toward it. But the true enlightenment is non-dual. And it's after that experience, which is not that easy to attain, but it's attainable, that then that experience becomes fused with, becomes one with the experience of all the differentiated beings. And yet, one still feels one with them, if you follow me. That's much more difficult. That's where compassion gets engaged. Because the only way you can possibly have that ability to identify that way, feel you are the mother of all beings, is you have to be a hormonal ocean, an ocean of a positive, an ocean of oxytocin. But it can be defined as you become an ocean of oxytocin. And that ocean of oxytocin means you perceive all the beings in it as pure bliss. They're just bubbles of bliss, every single one. Jazz deep. Well, Jazz deep is a bubble of bliss, even an ordinary though. With that hairdo and that headband and orange and the name, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do this. <laughs> and but you perceive every being that way. And then what do you encounter if you truly empathize with them all? You encounter their own misunderstanding of their own situation, where they feel not so well. Mm. They feel discontented. <laughs> they feel angry and annoyed or frightened or or crazed or whatever it may be. Or, or, or mad, you know. And then, since you feel all of that, and you realize that, you, that that's how they feel, you realize it in a non-dual way, completely, and yet you simultaneously 
realize that they are nothing but bliss, including, but they're shaping that bliss into a feeling of misery. That's your compassion. You simultaneously see the bliss that they are, and you feel the misery they feel that they are, and then all you are is a vast art form. Your oxytocin ocean takes the form of creativity to manifest whatsoever it takes to get them to open their awareness away from the feeling of enclosed in an envelope of misery to where they embrace their own bliss. Right? So, but that's a, that's a creativity that wants to liberate, not to proliferate, is what I'm saying. So therefore, it's a different creativity than the one assumed in cultures where they think the archetype is a god that creating something willy-nilly filled with suffering. You know, which of course the theistic traditions, creative theistic traditions, can never get out of that one, which is why they insist on blind faith. Because if, if there's an omnipotent being made everything and still on total on top of it all, and it's filled with death, and suffering and misery and the loss of children before parents and all of the worst things there are in the world, then what, what kind of weirdo is that? <laughs> As I think Shelley said, like some terrific demon to create such a veil of suffering. But the point is the Buddhists, so Buddhists are not against love though. Brahma, who was the creator in the Indian ordinary culture, you know, the Buddha and other and various Buddhist yogis met Brahma and, and Brahma said, Whoa, you know, don't blame me. I didn't create it all. People think I did because I was a, a big shot and I'm a really powerful being. But I didn't create it. And then, please, Buddha, you, I don't even understand this for me. He said, I'm not sure how it all works. He said, You, Buddha, I, at least I'm smart, I'm clairvoyant. I know you're going to understand it. When you do, please tell beings when horrible things happen to them, it's not my fault. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can for them. But, you know, they, it, we're all mutual. It's our mutual ignorances and our mutual sense of we are against it all and it's against us that causes all the suffering. So please tell them that, that we have mutual responsibility. <clears throat> oh, I hope you're not... Are you okay? Oh, you have to work. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so, oh, so I hope I think we're recording it. I hope. So. I I'm supposed it. to record. <coughs> I never record. Okay. Okay. I got it. I got it. okay. So, so, so that was Mike. So therefore, if that's the case and that's enlightenment, is the motherhood expanding? Never mind. Buddha looks like a male. Because he doesn't look that much by, like a male. By the way, if you ever want to check out any guru who's claiming to be a Buddha, perfect Buddha, just check out under the underwear. Seriously, one of the 32 marks of a Buddha is that the penis is in sheath like a stallion. It doesn't hang out. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's a fact in the tradition. I mean, I didn't ever notice anything like that. But that's a fact in the tradition. So, in a way, it doesn't really look that male. In normal thing. It's always, you can tell in India, the statue of the Mahavira of the Jain, who is very well hung, <laughs> and the statue of the Buddha, where it doesn't, you know, that fold there doesn't look like it. <coughs> which doesn't mean it doesn't have one, but it means it's drawn in a, in a sheath like structure, they say. So that's a sign. So any guru, you know, give them the, that's one of the guru tests you can, you can do. <laughs> which doesn't mean there can't be gurus and teachers, of course, as long as they don't pretend to be the ultimate. Himself. So, so, uh, so my point is that if that's what enlightenment is, actually, rather than escaping from all of this in some blinding, sort of fabulous, like self-congratulatory, self-satisfying situation, it is a very self-satisfying situation, but it's one that, like a mother, is in the same moment embracing all beings who are not yet necessarily, as far as they are concerned, in a satisfying situation. Actually, from Buddha's point of view, they are, which is why he can embrace them. Because he has a double vision, where he sees their real reality, and then he sees their artificial ignorance-based reality, driven reality. And, but then he's committed to, as a mother, is committed to save her child from suffering, to protect it from suffering. Uh, he, she, it, the Buddha's not always a he, 
is committed to bring, it, bring those beings into their awareness of their own bliss. No, not a bliss that Buddha gives them, not at all. They have it themselves. They just have to open to find it in themselves. Okay? So if that is a biological fact, as the Buddhist sciences say, then the biological reality is that the female form of the human being is superior to the male form. And therefore, in our era, in our time, of after 5,000 years of chauvinist, militaristic, violent, brute domination by males, which doesn't even make them happy, but and has very, very carnage, very seas of blood flow, then the women must step up and really take charge, at least, or at least balance. And, and maybe that will be new, since there we also discussed one thing that that uh, that Isa in her excellent summary didn't mention, was we also discussed this uh, this archaeology of, and discovery through literature and archaeology, but more archaeology because it was pre-text at least that we have, that there were many many you know millennia, uh, decades of millennia of female-dominated civilizations, matriarchal civilizations, throughout Eurasia, before the last five, ten thousand years, when the, the guys with their G.I. Joe kind of took over, starting with chariot warriors coming out of Central Asia, the first like Mongolian-type wars, came out of Central Asia to Europe and India and China and Persia and even all the way to Egypt and so on. So, <clears throat> So is that, that was my point. That's a great point. <laughs> and uh, today, since I'm supposed to contribute something, you know, in the, in the afternoon session, to help Isa Lifty doing the heavy, who's doing the main heavy lift in this class, what I thought I might do is move a little bit into, another thing we did, with a little touch on, with uh, people who were here before, is we experimented with this concept of selflessness and emptiness, and which is the, is the nature of ultimate reality from the point of view of Buddhist uh, science. And especially first point there to be made is that the emptiness is not nothingness. It is something between somethingness and nothingness. And actually what it is, is the condition of the somethingness. Because luckily, there is no nothingness. <clears throat> That's precisely what nothingness means, is it's not there. <laughs> and that's a really important thing for everyone to know. There is a the first part of the path, as taught by Tsongkhapa, taught by Atisha, taught by Manjushri, taught by Shakyamuni Buddha, is for human beings to realize the preciousness of their human embodiment. Mm -hmm. How precious you are is because you become a human being. Now, the materialist scientist, Carl Sagan, had a beautiful thing back in his Cosmos series, which some of you older people might have seen along with me in the 70s. And he had this thing where he would walk on the cosmic calendar, you know, from Precambrian slime, a few hundred thousand or a, a billion, half a billion years ago or something, whatever, on the planet. And he would walk down the days to like midnight or 11.30 p.m. where suddenly human beings come up around 100,000 years ago, according to that theory, you know. And then finally there's, the, there's Carl Sagan, actually. <laughs> 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 Professor at Cornell, tenure. And, and uh, you know, the highest achievement. And, uh, and, but he's the highest achievement because who has been coming all that long way some genes, and actually, according to the English guy from Oxford, selfish genes. <laughs> Not even selfless or compassionate genes, selfish genes. <laughs> Just trying to get more like Pac-Man. It's the march of Pac-Man. <laughs> Pac-Man has finally created a human being to consume more things, so it fits very well with consumer society. So we could, we have, we're, we're composed of billions of Pac-Man, you know, the microbiome, consuming things. And so we need, therefore, we need a Tesla. We need a BMW. <laughs> so, but he would still talk about how miraculous the human being is. You know, the joints of the arm and the fingers and the brain, what was he going on? So he has an appreciation. 
the material ascetics have a great appreciation of that. But where they fall short of the Buddhist science is that you, we personally were not involved in that amazing evolution. And not only were we not involved in that whole long, incredible past, but we're not even involved now. Because we have no soul, we have no real mind, it's an illusion of the brain. It stops the minute we die. So existentially, we're already nothing. Spiritually speaking, we're nothing, right? That's a key, cardinal point of material science, that we're all nothing. We're just waiting to realize it by dying. We sort of have previews by sleeping. <laughs> when we have a deep enough sleep, good enough sleeping pill, no dreams, right? So, so therefore, that worldview doesn't make us very precious as individual persons. We're just, we're maybe, you know, yeah, we're someone who depends on us, our child, well, we're precious to the child, they, have, they need us to grow up. So we're precious to our parents because we're their child. Maybe we're precious to our government because we pay taxes. <laughs> we're, you know, but but we're, they, they have an expression of materials. I think it's 85 cents of cap cheap chemicals in a bag of water. That's what we're worth. And, we're, and our presence and existence is an accident, and we, we change by random mutation. There's no causal process. We, so we can't control it. And then if we went to school and we studied Darwin, Marx, and Freud, we are completely convinced at the end of that that we have no free will and we're 100% helpless. And that guy, Daniel Kahneman at Stanford, just got a big prize for proving that you can't even make a choice. You wonderful made a beautiful thing yesterday about freedom means choice, ability, and responsibility, and ability to take, make choices. But according to them, your brain already made a choice two minutes before you knew about it. <coughs> and so they're proving to you that you're a helpless biological robot. All of them. They're completely insane, actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> but our, because why? Why am I saying that our scientific community is insane? Because they all have consciousnesses. They all have spirits themselves. That's what's making their mathematics and reading their machine dials and looking for the Higgs boson and worrying about dark matter and dark energy. Which I think they're scared they think it's the great mother. It's going to come in and know. <laughs> and they're uh, defending their 3% of bright matter. <laughs> and that's why they were screaming all over the papers worldwide that they have a Higgs boson, which I call the Higgs boson. <laughs> <laughs> but then they were qualifying at the end of each article. We have it, there's 97% dark energy and dark matter. We haven't yet seen it. Because it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's just cuckoo. <laughs> and they are running the planet into the toilet. That's why we're having spring in, 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 in winter. And, but they, you know, and they, they've even, they, they, they simultaneously tell us it's terribly dangerous and they tell us it's all over. We couldn't change it if we wanted. So they're naturally the politicians and the oil center selling people and coal people don't pay attention to that. But I'm sorry, that's a digression. Mainly, my point is, then on the other side, the theistic people, you're precious because you have a spark of that precious creator who there's no really good reason for you to believe in because of the existence of evil. Is that precious, actually? So it's not that, it's also a little difficult. That belief, but it's a bit, it's much better than the nothingness belief. And, and that preciousness is never to be experienced by you until after you die, and again, you have a salvation that you can go, if you've been good, and you've, you've gone to church or whatever, belong to the mega church or whatever, mm -hmm. or synagogue or mosque or temple, Hindu temple or whatever it might be, you then get to go and sing in the choir for eternity. So instead of all of that, why are you precious? You are precious because you personally have a beginningless life. Your own life is infinite. You have been in every conceivable life form there were in the past. Every, really, much more horrible ones than the human one. Also more divine ones than human ones. Demonic ones, even. And you've been Brahmans. You created the world. And then, but now, Somehow you have come to this the adjustment, so some intelligence of yours has risen, and you have chosen to be human by having chosen ethical reactions and actions in previous lives. And ethical means 
actions and reactions that take into consideration the beings you're interacting with. The animal with suffering and life is called, in Buddhist science, the suffering of one eating another. You know, just immediate consumption. It's like the Pac-Man world. You live in fear of being consumed by a lion or a tiger, you're a deer, and then you're consuming, actually deers are nice, they're just eating grass. <coughs> Maybe they pick up a few ants with their tongue, but they may be eating grass. But some animals both eat and be eaten. And that's, that's really, and their, their evolution is such. But then when you were an animal, when I was an animal, don't take it personally, then sometime I was about to pounce on something and eat it. And then some dim thing in my little brain that mainly wants to eat, identified with that thing and saw it was scurrying off to steal her chocolate. And it wanted to run off somewhere and get a piece of chocolate. And I identified because I like to run off and get a piece of chocolate. So I didn't pounce on it. And then I waited a little while, and I got more hungry and pounced on another one. But that tiny little increment of feeling what they're identifying with the other thing, and then not using it, and letting it go, is it, it's ethicality. It's the beginning of ethicality. Not harming it. And, but imagine how many of those have to build up incrementally to get to be a human, who can actually give its own life to another. Or even to get to be a mammal, then before that, the lesser animals are, they lay eggs, right? The young, you know, I don't even know how to have sex, but I guess when they swim by some place, she drops eggs and he goes by and sprays around there. Then they all take off, and then it's up to the eggs to manage, right? That's one way. Well, then that's what it is. <laughs> so then, when you have it inside your body, even mammals like tigers, lions, deers, that's a much bigger commitment to at least one other by the female. And then the human gets where, it's not that humans can have more, you know, triplets or something. It's just that the human, it's much more, you, you know, they can think their way in and out, whatever it is. So, you are precious because you have become a being that has access to freedom. You have freedom from all kinds of hardwiring and, and, and evolutionary niches, environmental niches where you can only do one thing. And also you have freedom in this kind of a society where you're free to come to a class on the Great Mother and the sort of Buddhist relation to the Great Mother. And you can change yourself, go through portals of creativity, of tolerating the, the, the letting go of some old structure and opening into a new insight. And that's the, how many people on this planet do that on a Saturday? <laughs> Not so many. And many of them, there's hundreds of millions of slaves on this planet right now. Actual slaves. Owned people. We have a lot of women, also boys and things, slaving in factories or groves and things. Hundreds of millions of them. And then people in prisons. And then they are slaves. In our country we have two, three million people and they have to work in there. So they are also slaves. They get 35 cents a day in their prison cell. And something like that. They make license plates and the road signs you see on the highway. Um, and uh, you're free, so that you have all these kind of freedoms, and you're also intelligent. You don't, you're not defective in your brain or your mind or something. And you, and you can really, you can do yoga. You can think. You can, you can channel. And, and uh, on the other hand, you're also in a place where there are teachings, there are guides, there are enlightened beings. Their presence is there in literature. If you can't find one on the street, you can find a book. You know, and but there are so many who are there, and the men are particularly lucky, since they're a little backward. That's made up for the fact that there are equal number, of more or less, of women to teach them something if they would be smart enough to learn. Right? Someone once asked me, you know, when I talked about a concept of cool heroism, in other words, the person who reacts to injury and provocation without reactive fury and anger, and you know, even self-destructive blind fury and anger, which is, which is what normal, when fury takes you over, where you have bad judgment, pretty much self-destructive, although it may also harm others in the way. And they said, well, where is any of these cool heroes on this planet? You know, you know and, 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 and conflict to my argument that we all totally believe that anybody can go in, the, in any military and get brainwashed and conditioned in boot camp 
to do what they normally wouldn't do as nice people, which is go around and stab people with bayonets and shoot them and machine gun them and do horrible things to them. And they can be trained to be callous in other words about others, and also even risk their lives completely to do so. But they're supposed to do only, you know, survival of the self is only what they're supposed to do. But they can be trained not to survive. And therefore they were doubting that people <coughs> as a cool hero can be willing to give their body without harming anybody else without hating anybody, in other words, using love rather than hatred to develop an equal self-detachment. They made that argument, and then they asked me, asked me, to show what a dumb man I am. I was like, feeling really cornered by this argument. Like, where can I find a Gandhi, you know, I'm thinking like that. <coughs> and then, of course, I realized, I thought of my own family, both my birth family and my present family, my, where I'm a father. And I realized the males in the families are often Locked in violent confrontations. Siblings fight each other. Father and son fight each other all the time. They have, you know, Oedipal thing tells them they're supposed to, actually. And siblings in societies where they don't fight, they're not fighting bears or wolves or, you know, they don't have to do farm work together and they don't need each other. They're just competing for resources and fighting over the chocolate bar. So they don't necessarily get along. So then I realized, well, how do families stay together? Well, of course, it's because women are in the family. And the women don't react with immediate counter-violence and immediate re re en en avenging energy instantly when there's conflict. And they're always in the middle taking blows. No, dear, you didn't mean that. No, don't beat each other. No, don't hit him with that club. No. And sometimes getting in the way and getting hit themselves. Occasionally, some of them get rough, you know, like, what was that, Elena Bobbitt? I mean, they case. <laughs> but, but, but mostly, they're bearing the brunt and they're cementing, you know, the oxytocin is keeping the cortisol from blowing up every single family on the planet, all the time. So there's your cool heroes, right there. That guy was nailed. <laughs> it was, but it, it was disgusting that I had to figure it out. It took me so long, having been the beneficiary having a hot temper throughout my life of, of women who are showing cool heroism. So, so the preciousness, you would not waste your time in your life just making money or just achieving this worldly or getting another house or rushing around like this and like that. Instead of, not that those things are are some degree unnecessary for most people. But you wouldn't waste your time putting so much priority on quote unquote survival things if you realize how precious your opportunity, your life moments and days and weeks and months of waking time, and even you're going to learn to use sleep time and dream time, if you realize that you are at a moment where you can accelerate your evolution towards vast embodiment of great motherhood, of great enlightenment, of great blisshood, you could, in this life form, like incrementally, like leapfrog, leapfrogging over billions of lifetimes, of slogging along, just grabbing what is in front of you. And that is the purpose for realizing how precious, from a scientific point of view, how precious your present intelligence, embodiment, and sensitivity, and creativity is. And, if you, and, and, and all that kind of meditation coming from the Buddhist sciences, appealing from the great mother of wisdom, doesn't just mean you sit and sort of just try to condition yourself of, I'm so precious, I'm so precious, I'm so precious, like that great guy who, on the TV who says that, I'm worth it and I'm nice, and you know that thing. That's also okay to do, but think about why you don't think you're precious. Who told you that you have no soul? And what evidence do they have? Who told you that the consequences of how you live end at your death, whether you're good or bad, before it's all over? There's no effect. And it's just an accident anyway. And you're just a robot. What evidence do they have for that? Which person, I always like to say, did Carl Sagan report back, saying, hey guys, it's cool, don't worry, I'm nothing. <laughs> There's no future experience consequence to how I live. Good or bad, so don't sweat too much. Right? 
Take a break. Drive your BMW. Why not? Even if the whole planet goes down, everybody will be nothing. They won't miss being on the planet. After they've gone. They'll be anesthetized. Eternal. What evidence will there, not only what evidence is it, they always tell me. I say, I have a friend who's a movie maker. He contemplated making, made, making a biography of me on the film. And, you know, fictionalized. But anyway, he had a scene in the end where I was at Columbia at Lowell Library. Or it could be Widener Library at Harvard, anyway. A big room like that. And I was on trial from the natural scientists <laughs> and the social scientists and the, all the humanists who grovel to them all the time. And I was on trial for, for misleading the young into thinking they might have a future life and a former life. <laughs> and I was being, being forced to recant. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that would be the concluding scene, but that would be cool. Right? Yeah, it looked about a sense. So I kind of like it. But then, because they always ask you, what's your evidence? There is no evidence for future life, former life. And then you say to them, well, there is a lot of evidence. Many people remember previous lives. There's huge literature of documentation of people remembering previous lives. And continuity is the rule in nature. And you, have, you guys have the law of thermodynamics. And mind, is consciousness, and soul have energy. So they are energies. And you have a doctrine that no energies can be destroyed. I grant you if people say mind has no energy, then that's conceding to you. But that's not what we say. Mind has a very, just a very subtle energy, but it has energy. Of course it does. It changes, moves, it's lives. It's alive. Your spirit and your mind and your soul is alive. It's infinitely alive. So there's a lot of evidence, and there's a lot of reasons. And, and, and then you say to them, what is your evidence that you could have some energetic process become nothing? Uniquely the, the spirit of a living being. All others you have proper dynamics. No energy is ever destroyed in the universe. So it's, it's ridiculous, it's even incoherent to say a stream of anything becomes nothing. It just changes form. And they can never say that. But they, they try to just make a dogmatic assertion that mind in particular never did exist. And therefore they give you the salvation. You know, the scientists are high priests. They're big bang, you know, and all their crap. They're a bunch of high priests. And they're telling you, they know what's going to happen to you, so rely on them. And they give you salvation in that you don't have to pay for consequences of anything negative you ever did. And there's no, problem, no reason to really strive to do anything positive that hard. You don't have to run, run after Bernie and do a political revolution and create a miracle and get rid of the oligarchs and the morons who presently have usurped our democratic government and are not serving, not doing their job and not serving the people. But we just nothing we can do about it. We're all powerless because we're just biological robots. <coughs> so that so then so that makes second point so first point you females are the superior half of the human species and you're getting a raw deal worldwide actually you may think if you're in California or in New York <laughs> you're kind of doing okay but actually you, the Equal Rights Amendment was never ratified in this Neanderthal country and <coughs> the rest of the world is really tough. And mm -hmm. there I recommend, I told Alexander about it, a book by Marilyn Waring, and those who are making notes, sociologist from New Zealand, called, W-A-R-I-N-G, called Counting for Nothing, called the, the Labor of Women. And she means labor in both senses. That labor bringing life to birth to beings, and gestating them and bringing them to birth, and then labor actually in the in the, in the economy. So, so that's so. Point one is you are the better half of the species. So you have that. You have you can have, take pride in that and assert the power of that, and you also have the responsibility of that. And you can't just hide. You should. You know it won't help. You. Point one. Point two. The human species as a whole, even the guys, is an immense, immensely precious life form. And each individual who has one has labored enormously in the infinite previous lives. And every male has been female. And every female has been male in previous lives. And 
this life, therefore, should be educational in the deepest evolutionary sense. That's what human life is for, to expand toward Buddha life, toward enlightened life, which doesn't have anything to do with religion. It doesn't mean being a Buddhist. It means becoming, expanding that empathy and sensitivity to the infinite degree. And then, third point is, and for that I brought today the flower ornament scripture, as or sutra, which it doesn't really mean, it means discourse, but of course this is your text form, so it's a scripture of a discourse, of many discourses of the Buddha. And that discourse goes into creativity, actually. Closer to what, you know, the idea of creating a world would be. But what it is, it's recreating a world of suffering into a world of bliss. Both being relative worlds, though. The world of bliss is not an absolute world. The world of suffering is already an absolute world. And it isn't really suffering. That's what, the absolutely speaking, it's a blissful world. No, no, don't leave. No, <laughs> come back. <laughs> I know why you're going out. <laughs> Just. My friend, my dear friend. Please stay. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, in the Chinese commentary on this school based on this sutra, which the Chinese are called the Huayan Shu, or Huayan Jiao, the school of the flower ornament, or the garden. And the garland is a garland of universes, actually. It's what is meant by the garland. Flower, universe, flowers of universes. And there are said to be three levels of this. And the first is the level of seeing true voidness. And so the Dharma door of non duality, the Dharma door of selflessness, the Dharma door of, of emptiness, is where you overcome your fear of death by letting go of yourself meditatively, which is the deepest way. Actually, when you give a gift with true generosity, which is something you truly care for, which you actually want, but then you let go of to give to someone else, in spite of the fact that you want it, and then you don't also think about, oh, gee I'm so great, I gave a gift. Like Isa gave her acorn to the mountain. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it means it to you. Anyway, when you do that, that's like you die a little bit. You know, that you're letting go of something precious to you. So that's like a kind of mini, mini death. Anytime you let go of anything, you let, when you let go of, a, of an impulse that you have to do something, you know, uh, angry or greedy or something, and you let go of that, that's, you're letting go of some habitual structure, it's yet you're, you're, you're letting it, you're destroying it a little bit, you're, happy, you're restraining it. That's also realizing emptiness, actually. When you feel like reacting to injury with fury and anger and counter-injury, and you refrain, you restrain your anger, that's a little bit of a death, you know, a little bit of a, a little bit of a destroying the old pattern. And all you, through which those are all doors of those are the portals of creativity, as I understand, which is what I think I'm talking about, as a sign by you. And, and, but the most deep way is you, you critically analyze your body and mind and self, seeking that self that, that we habitually think is the real thing that's in here, the fixed identity, the real me. And, and when you fail to find that and sustain that failure to find, you find lots of relational processes. Of course, which in a way constitutes yourself as a flow being, as a relational being. But you don't find a fixed thing that's your real you, you know, that holds on to your social security number, your barcode, your, your fixed identity. You don't find anything. <coughs> Everything, including your name, is just relative. You actually are, you do exist as a relative process. You don't exist as a fixated thing. And when you realize that viscerally, that sense of being that fixated thing has to let go of itself. You've got to let go of holding on to the, that illusion. Your ignorance makes you hold on to that illusion, and you let go of it. And that's the portal to the new you, which is 
but you know never is fixed. So therefore you have to constantly be nurturing it. You constantly create it. You constantly make it beautiful. You constantly make it do beautiful. You constantly make it good. You constantly make it do good. You constantly make it real and true and integrity. And you do integrity and real and good and true. And that's always a work in progress. Because the beautiful is always beautiful to someone in a context. The good is good to someone in a context. The true is something true in a context. It's never some absolute fixated thing. So you become a living work of art. You yourself. So the first step in the Chinese version of the, of the flower ornament school is seeing true voidness or selflessness or emptiness, whatever you want to call it, the negational freedom from all fixated non-relative non structure or non-relative core that we assume things to have and we assume ourselves to have. That's seeing true voidness. And that's where you, by following that deeply, you will reach an experience if you become an adept meditator and you truly use your critical analytic, not blind faith, not just believing that's so, critically analyzing what makes it seem to you that it's not so, is how you get there. And when you do that, you will have that experience of everything, including yourself, disappearing. One of the thresholds being a kind of frightening feeling that you're going to get lost somewhere or you're going to become nothing or everything will become nothing, which you control by realizing that nothing is nothing, Eureka. <laughs> mm. So that you can't be in it. Mm. But you, it will, everything does disappear. It's a vast, luminous, very releasing state past the letting go, which is a little bit frightening. Then, once you reach that second step in this Yan, is where you realize that that disappeared state is the only, is the reality of it, but that is not destructive of the appeared state. And then the appeared state re reappears like the reflections, uh, reflection in a mirror. For example, it's like the analogy being, when you discover that the mirror is a blank surface of shiny matter, and it has no scene in it that you see when you look in your rear view mirror or in your mirror and see your face or something, there is no other you in there. There's no face in there. It's only a reflection on this blank surface. So, and therefore, the reflection is simultaneously the surface. Although it's blank itself of the, of the image that's reflected, it also does reflect the image. And now all of the differentiated things that you see there are like reflections. You follow me? But yet it's so deep and inconceivable at the visceral level that, the, that no analogy really matches it. You follow that? So the second one is the non-duality of the absolute and relative, which means that, that the absolute emptiness is the relativity. That this is, that nirvana is this relative, conventional, samsaric world. And it's only samsaric, meaning bearing suffering, for those who don't know that it is also the absolute. And who think that each little thing in it is an absolute, conflicting against the other absolute. Because of ignorance. And then the third level, and so that level <coughs> is kind of cementing the portal with the place of being. So that the whole place of being becomes a portal, something like that. And by knowing that, the mother, the mother sensitivity, the mother compassion, the mother wisdom, has no, realizes there's no escape from all the relational. And there's no escape all the beings. And you know, we're all here. We're not over it. This is not over at six o'clock. It's not even six o'clock. It's not over then. We leave. We never leave. We're here together forever. We even when we die, we'll be reborn with each other. Again and again. We have already been met each other. Again and again. How why do we come here? How come we're here? Well, we've already been doing many things with each other, infinite times in the past. And now we're here again. And we'll continue in the future. So then the mother, knowing that, and if we really know what this is, all of us, we will realize this is fine, it's not a problem, we don't need to escape from this, this is bliss. We're all each other's mothers. 
We are all mothers of each other. We're all here to create happiness for each other. We all love each other. That's the best way to be when we're forced to be together in for eternity. <laughs> There's no escape from it. So how can we be having conflict? Conflict only comes from thinking, I'm going to get rid of this one. I don't want that one out of my life. I, you know, we, we, the two of us and I can't coexist at the same time. Time, time. So then the third one, though. So then, the mother wants to spread over everything. The great female, the great mother, President Parliament. Then the third plane of this, which is what the sutra really expands, is called the Magnificent Activities Path. You could call it the Magnificent Creativity Path, for sure. Because this creativity is not to proliferate new worlds just for the heck of it, disregarding its impact on others. It is creativity drawn by love of others, made by love of others, which therefore is drawn by others' need for happiness and need for freedom from suffering. Compassion being the way you hook up to another, to another's need for freedom from suffering, that's called your compassion. And your, ha and your love means hooking up with others' need for happiness. So they're like two, they're part of a circuit. So therefore you can't have real compassion actually unless you have some happiness to share. Because well, if you're miserable, how would you, and you think that's the natural way of things, how would you think that another who's miserable could be anything other than that? You wouldn't really feel that intuitively. Only when you have some bliss and you realize you see the other pinched one like, uh, and then, then you see they don't need to be pinched up like that. And then, then you, you have compassion, you say, you don't need that bliss. And you see, you feel, you can, just like we always see others, you know, when we're paranoid, we think everybody else is afraid of everything. When we're happy, we see everyone else smiling. You know, we notice some, whatever they feel good about. So then this is called, not the non-duality of, of absolute and relative but the non-duality of relative and relative. Shi shi wai, if anybody knows Chinese. Are you Chinese or Japanese? Uh, Korean? Mongolian. Nisha Gohoran? Oh, Mongolian. She's from Mongolia. Oh, Mongolia Kera. Say no. My spiritual father and grandfather were Mongolians, Kalmyks and Buryatis. Um, yeah. You're Buryatia? Uh, Kalmyks. What? Kalmyks, Buryatia, Kalmyks, Mongolians. Oh? Okay. Buryatia means Siberia. Uh. Very cold in winter. <laughs> so, okay, I'm sorry. So, the, the, it means the non obstruction, non duality, mutual non obstruction, non duality of thing and thing, of relativity and relativity. And so what that means is, based on the knowledge of the absolute being relative, that the relative and relative are mutually intertransformable, and therefore magic and miracle are possible. Magic and miracle are possible. And to benefit others then, if you go deeper and deeper into that, then there's nothing you can't do to benefit another. Freedom from Impulse from craving. <laughs> so, so, so this sutra is 1,500 pages in in uh, translation from Sanskrit into Chinese, and then from Chinese into uh, English by my friend. And there are different versions, both in Sanskrit and Chinese. Uh, and the, within the sutra, there are many sutras. But I just wanted to, there's no, you, you can't describe it. It's called the inconceivable liberation. In a way, you can't really describe it, but you just have to, you just have to sort of let it resonate in the imagination. So what I thought I would do now at this point is have you meditate and not listen to me with, with sort of reasoning mind, which I hopefully you were doing until now. 
but meditate with your imagination and your visualization. <coughs> but and don't, you can't probably very actively rush out and paint a picture of this extraordinary types of, of uh, description. So you just sort of let yourself float in it, okay? But be in a meditative mind. So thus did I hear it one time, which is all sutras, which are records of Buddha's discourses, are, uh, that's a sort of, sort of certificate of authenticity, that someone actually heard this. It was there when Buddha said it. And it's, but this is introductory, saying where Buddha was and what Buddha is. The Buddha was in the land of Magadha, somewhere in India near uh, where, uh, anyway, in the middle of India, an important kingdom at that time, in a state of purity at the site of enlightenment. Actually, at the Bodhi, he's under the tree of enlightenment, actually. He's under a tree like a shaman, sitting under the tree of enlightenment, having just realized true awareness. The ground was solid and firm made of diamonds, adorned with exquisite jewel discs and myriad precious flowers with pure, clear crystal. The ocean of characteristics of the various colors appeared over an infinite extent. There were banners of precious stones, constantly emitting shining light and producing beautiful sounds. Nets of myriad gems and garlands of exquisitely scented flowers hung all around. The finest jewels appeared spontaneously, raining inexhaustible quantities of gems and beautiful flowers all over the earth. There were rows of jeweled trees, their branches and foliage lustrous and luxurious. By the Buddha's spiritual power, he caused all the adornments of this enlightenment site to be reflected therein. This is creativity. The tree of enlightenment was tall and outstanding. Its trunk was diamond. Its main boughs were sapphire. Its branches and twigs were of various precious elements. The leaves spreading in all directions provided shade like clouds. The precious blossoms were of various colors. The branching twigs spread out their shadows. Also the fruits were jewels, edible jewels, containing a blazing radiance. They were, together with the flowers, in great arrays. The entire circumference of the tree emanated light. Within the light there rained precious stones. And within each gem there were enlightening beings, like angelic bodhisattvas, in great hosts, like clouds, simultaneously appeared. Micro, bodhi, micro angels, micro bodhisattvas. Also by virtue of the awesome spiritual power of the Buddha, the tree of enlightenment constantly gave forth sublime sounds, speaking various truths without end. You see, this is, this is the Buddha mother of all beings, spreading the exquisite nurturing membrane of emptiness, which is ultimate, absolute reality, inconceivably spreading, which is inconceivably a nurturing membrane that fits every macro and micro configuration of every form of differentiated life with ultimate nurture of beauty, truth, and goodness. He is spreading this womb of ultimate reality, which is, which is his body, in the form of his womb body, which is infinite also, which therefore is enfolding all beings, enfolding them within their own Buddha potential, as embryonic Buddhas themselves, not as somehow dependent upon himself, because he feels one with them, and he's, he knows that what they need is to realize they are one with him. And therefore, this membrane is completely enfolding all of them, infinitely, not just on the one planet, not just in the one place or the one monetary, but infinitely, throughout the universe across the space, cosmic space, with the speed of light, beyond the speed of light, instantaneous, you know, spooky action at a distance, as they call it, the quantum people. Spooky meaning, holy spooky. <laughs> also by virtue of the, also, yeah, tree of enlightenment constantly gave forth sublime sounds, speaking various truths without end. 
the palace chamber in which the Buddha was situated, his womb, that is, his emptiness, absoluteness womb, was spacious. It's not just him, the body, an envelope being sitting under a tree different from things around him. That's just a form, still maintaining it. Because that's helpful for some to perceive as a doorway to the vastness, the infinity of the Buddha presence. It extended throughout the ten directions. It was made of jewels of various color and was decorated with all kinds of precious flowers. The various adornments radiate lights like clouds, and the masses of their reflections from within the palace form banners. A boundless host of enlightening beings, angelic bodhisattvas, the congregation at the site of enlightenment, were all gathered there by means of the ability to manifest the lights and even inconceivable sounds of the Buddhas, they fashioned nets of the finest jewel from which came forth all the realms of action of the spiritual powers of the Buddha and in which were reflected images of the abodes of all beings. And then he talks about their thrones and their radiance and, you know, oh yeah, at that time, I'll skip a little, the Buddha, the world honored one, in this setting, which, which he's maintaining the setting, he's maintaining the appearance of still being the individual being, separate from others, who was a prince and a king and then a yogi and then became a Buddha. So that beings can relate to that as a doorway of their own becoming, and own, their own selves as human beings, you know, male and female, young and old, whatever, being able to find their own Buddhahood. In other words. So he means himself that present for a while. Not, for, not forever, but at this point, but for a while. At that time, the Buddha, in this setting, attained to supreme correct awareness of all things. His knowledge entered, I would translate, realistic awareness of all things. His knowledge entered into all times with complete equanimity. His body filled all worlds. His voice universally accorded with all lands in the ten directions. Like space, which contains all form, he made no discrimination among all objects. And as space extends everywhere, he entered, entered all lands with equanimity. That's the spreading of that shunyata karna garbha, emptiness, the womb of compassion. His body forever sat omnipresent in all sites of enlightenment, because he repeated this in every humanoid world. There are infinite numbers. Carl Sagan needn't have worry with his seti seti. There's trillions of human worlds, endless numbers, infinite numbers of them, everywhere. And my mind, we can know that and can visit there. And with enlightenment, we are aware and present there. Among the host of enlightening beings, his awareness light, his awesome light shone like clearly, like the sun emerging, illumining the world. The ocean of myriad virtues which he practiced in all times was thoroughly pure. He's also present in all time, in the past, present, and future. He goes backwards into every element of time, changing the past, actually. It's not impossible to do at all. The ocean of myriad virtues which he practiced in all times was thoroughly pure, and he constantly demonstrated the productions of all the Buddha lands, their boundless forms and spheres of light extending throughout the center of cos the entire cosmos, cosmos equally in and impartially. He expounded all truths like spreading great clouds. Each of his hair tips was able to contain all universes without interference, in each manifesting immeasurable spiritual powers, teaching and civilizing all sentient beings. His body extended throughout the ten directions, yet without coming or going. His knowledge entered into all forms, and realized the avoidance of all things. All the miraculous displays of the Buddhas of past, present, and future were all seen in his light, and all the adornments of inconceivable aeons were revealed. So here is it spread through all time, you know, in every version of, of Buddha's biography, there's this thing that before he becomes fully enlightened under the Bodhi, under the tree of enlightenment, he he, uh, he remembers infinite previous lives of himself. And then you wonder, well, how come he didn't do that before? Mm -hmm. And other beings can realize a few previous lives, but very few can realize infinite previous lives, as he did. And, you know, I had this eureka moment a few years ago, 
where I realized, why was he able to do that? Why don't we remember our previous lives? Because we suffered in our previous lives. We suffered death out of that just past life. We have many sufferings in the previous life, and so on and so on, back infinitely. So just like we have, a, it's a good human thing, like when you go into shock, or when you have a bad injury, after a while you don't remember the agony and the pain. And so we don't want to remember those things. But nirvana means realizing the, that the uncreated is the infinite nurturing, compassionate womb of reality, bringing, you know, you know, making manifest the bliss of all life already, not later, not, but already. When you realize that, you realize retroactively that when you were suffering in past lives, even in hell, you were actually in bliss, and your ignorance was making a hell around yourself, was making yourself into a terrible struggle, was making yourself into terrible grief, grief and, and horror, and anger, and fury, and, and pain, and so on. So you, you get a double vision about your own past. So then you can critique. You automatically see through your, your ignorance-driven perception of your past as, a, as suffering. So you actually realize that your past is different than you thought it was. Even your death was only your bliss. Death is only where you expand in bliss. So, so there's nothing, there's no, that's deathless. That's why he said that reality was deathless. That door, that door, the death-like door, which the egocentric person sees as death, which is giving of oneself, the death-like door, portal, into creativity is actually not death. It is just vast opening. And it opens to the reality of the infinitely available energy of the Great Mother, of the Great Mother of Transcendent Wisdom, which is infinitely available, which at men we all sleep in. Right? Did anybody, I hope everybody slept in the clear light. Mm -hmm. You don't sleep in a dark thing, even though you do, in a, you sleep hopefully in a dark room. <laughs> and you close your eyes and you don't hear anything. But your, you, your cells and your being falls into beneath the darkness or within the darkness is the clear light, the diamond clear, infinite energy field of the infinite womb of the great mother Buddha, the great enlightened mother. Now, second point in this one is, we still have time, a tiny bit, second light. Is the, is the concept of Samantha Bhadra. Samantha Bhadra means total goody goody. <laughs> <laughs> Samantha Bhadra means. Samantha means thorough going all around. Bhadra means good. So, so no, I don't know, I won't, I won't take it because I don't have time. So, <laughs> Samantha Bhadra is this bodhisattva, a particular type of bodhisattva who, like Manjushri and Avalokiteshvara and Tara, etc., is actually Buddha, but he then manifests as a Bodhisattva to appear everywhere to beings to help them. And his particular, he's like Ant-Man. He's the Ant-Man of Bodhisattvas. You know that movie, Ant-Man? <laughs> oh, you don't read comics, you're going to be so high fluid. But they, had, they, had a movie. they made a Marvel movie about him. And it was quite fun. I mean, for childish people like me, anyway. And that means that he goes in the micro world. You know, the, the vision of this non-obstruction of thing and thing, based on the realization of the non-obstruction of absolute emptiness and total, total relativity, sees the entirety of the infinite universe in every atom within that infinite universe. It's a holographic vision of reality. So Samantabhadra is the Bodhisattva who is holographically present in every universe, in every atom. And even in each universe in an atom, the atoms of that universe in the atom have universes in their atoms. And even those atoms of that universe there have universes in their atoms, and so on and so on. And Samantabhadra is everywhere in them. Although, of course, at some point, right, like the wave particle paradox, you lose track of a solid thing like an atom, because atoms dissolve under analysis also. They're just relational construct sort of levels of magnification. And then the wave becomes more flowing and more fluid. But you go infinitely to the microverse, infinitely to the macroverse. This whole universe here is only like 
a subatomic particle in a vast universe of which this is a subatomic particle, and so on, tiered up. And Samantha Butter is present like a holographic thing of infinite goodness present in every micro element of everything. So, for example, in every part of your body. So the yoga of samadhapata that you do is sort of realizing that your own, what are you made of? Are you made of atoms? Or you're made of molecules, you're told. But actually, you're not really made of molecules or atoms. That's just a level of magnification about you. What you're really made of, of is light. Because the atoms are made up of photons and electrons and nuclei. And then those nucleuses are not solid, and then they get down to where they don't know what it is. You know, they get into the wave particle paradox, they get into the uncertainty principle, where there is no such thing as objective reality of some solid, indivisible thing, which Buddha predicted thousands of years ago. This sutra predicts that, thousands of years ago. When you, if you ever viscerally know that by becoming a Buddha, which everybody can do, and everybody is going to do, at some time, maybe not in this life. But whenever they do, it will be in all their lives. So no problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when they get into that, then they can shape out of the very constitutive, you know, inconceivable level of energy, of infinite. Remember that uh, they've discovered, quantum people in their mathematics and things have this strange thing where they've discovered that a vacuum has infinite energy, mathematically. It's called the zero quantum infinite, zero quantum infinite energy field or something. They have different words and names for it. And it's kind of, they don't quite get how that could happen, but it sort of pops up out of their equations. But it's perfectly said, because the clear flight of the void, this diamond infinite energy, the reason that you really can't spot it easily is that since it's infinite, it doesn't need to do anything. It just kind of, it sort of vibrates there. It doesn't really need to vibrate either. But someone who approached it might feel it was vibrating. But therefore, it's there to be drawn out infinitely by any being, relational being, that has any kind of need. So this is the, this is the infinite goodness of the universe, actually. That it's there to supply of the Great Mother. That every cell of her body is there to supply every need of her nurturing, nurturable in, in children. Which they say Buddha is, that's what Buddha consciousness is, they say. The mother analogy, they, they also go to father thing. Somehow try to drag the poor guy along. But mm -hmm. the mother is the bigger focus. So Samantabhadra is a way of, of, the, of the individual identifying with that. So that, for example, <coughs> if I do a good thing, like I hold hands and say beauty before me, if I make a bow, and prostrate myself on the earth to touch Mother Earth and to show my connectedness to her and to humble my sort of feeling of being independently floating up there somehow and, and make a gift of, showing a gift of submitting to reality in a sense, being realistic because of trusting reality th that it's goodness and it's nurturance and it's love. And so when I do that, I simultaneously imagine at first that my, myself, in every universe, in every atom, in my body, which are, have infinite universes in them, and there are infinite replicas of myself in there, like some antivitals, and they are also bowing at the same time. So I'm multiplying the merit and the power of my act by having it multiplied microcosmically and holographically. You follow? That's the yoga of some and so that's a, so, and there's this beautiful thing where, which I like, where they talk about the, the enlightening being, universally good, entered into a concentration called the imminent body of the illuminator of suchness. Suchness means reality, that everything is not exactly itself, it's such as itself, because it's also the absolute. And therefore it's like a reflected, it's in a mirror reflection of a relative thing in the mirror surface of the absolute. So therefore it's only such as itself, in other words, like itself. It's, it's illusory that it's really itself, and it's actually only like itself. So therefore it's simultaneously absolute and relative, it's called suchness. And actually, it's a little tiny bit different in emphasis from what's called 
thatness, which, which means that you're aware of the relative having the absolute in it, whereas such as means you're aware of the absolute as being manifest in the relative. So he calls it the imminent body of the illuminator of suchness, which is in all enlightened ones. It enters everywhere into the equal essence of all enlightened ones, and is capable of manifesting myriad images in the cosmos, vastly and immensely without obstruction equal to space. All the whirling oceans, here you meditate again, just for another five minutes. All the whirling oceans of universes flow along into it. It produces all states of concentration, samadhi, and can contain all worlds in all directions. The oceans of lights of knowledge of all the enlightened ones come from here. It can reveal all the oceans of all conditions everywhere. It contains within it all the powers and liberations of the enlightened ones and the knowledge of the enlightening being. It can cause the particles of all lands to be universally able to contain boundless universes. It develops the ocean of virtuous qualities of all Buddhas and reveals the ocean of great bounds of these enlightened ones. All the cycles of teaching of the Buddhas flow through it and are guarded and maintained by it and kept without interruption or end. <coughs> and the teaching just means, the point of teaching is that's the greatest thing that the enlightened mind can do for the unenlightened ones who think they're suffering. The bliss enlightened mind is get them to understand their bliss. So therefore that is teaching is required. Sometimes it need not be verbal. Sometimes it's a gesture. Sometimes it's just presence. But sometimes it's a light. Sometimes it's a scent. Sometimes it's a sound. It's, it's a, it, it, the, the concept of teaching means that the learner then can open to their real, more realistic condition. And he goes on and he says, and uh, as in this world the enlightening being universally good, Samantha Pandra, entered this concentration in the presence of the Buddha, thus in the same way throughout the realm of space of the cosmos, in all directions and all times, in a subtle, unhindered, vastly expansive light, in all lands visible to the Buddha's eye, within reach of the Buddha's power, manifested by the Buddha's body, and in each atom of all of those lands, there were Buddhas as numerous as atoms in an ocean of worlds, and in front of each Buddha were universally good enlightening beings, numerous as atoms in an ocean of worlds, each also entering into this concentration in the imminent body of the illuminator of thusness in enlightened ones. Anyway, that's enough, because we're going to stop for dinner. But the, that then leads to a moment in that chapter where the Buddha in this, on this planet, in this world, he reaches out and he pats the meditating bodhisattva, Samantabhadra, who is in the illuminator of thusness <coughs> of all worlds, in all atoms of every infinite world, and he pats him on the head. He gives him, he goes, pat, pat, he touches him on the head, which is like a little bit, it's like affection, but it's also initiatory. But it's like a mother patting, cuddling her child, this a pat on the head. And then simultaneously in all the atoms and all the universes in infinite directions, all the Buddhas are patting on the head. Just patting on the head. I really like that. Yeah. And then later in the Sutra, in another session, <coughs> maybe tomorrow or tonight, if we're going to have discussion, or if we stop the discussion, I can do that. There's a thing where one of the, not Samantha Bhadra, he's always around because he's in every atom, but another guy who's a human, who's looking for teachers, he, ha he meets ten goddesses, and one of them is Buddha's mother, uh, Maya Devi, which means, Maya means the creative power, Maya. Rude people call her illusion power, but polite people call her magical goddess, and Devi means goddess. So the goddess of magical power, Maya Devi, and she's the mother of Buddha. Siddhartha. But she simultaneously, in many planets, gives birth to Siddhartha, and many, not just here, but he is also here. Anyway, he meets her, and she gives him a kind of teaching, which is really amazing. Uh, I might read that later. If we have a chance tomorrow morning for a few minutes. Okay, I'll ask more. Okay. So, now we don't sing. <laughs> and we, we form a circle. Yeah. And Justin can run out. Oh. <laughs>